Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum. Chapter One, The Arrival. Is this the station, Grandpa Jim? Inquired a young girl as the train began to slow up. I think so, Mary Louise. Replied the handsome old gentleman addressed. It doesn't look very promising, does it? She continued, glancing eagerly out of the window. The station? No, my dear. But the station isn't Cragg's Crossing, you know. It is merely the nearest railway point to our new home. The conductor opened their drawing room door. The next stop is Chargrove, Colonel. He said, "Thank you." The porter came for their hand baggage, and a moment later the long train stopped and the vestibule steps were let down. If you will refer to the timetable of the D R and G railway, you will find that the station of Chargrove is marked with a character dagger, meaning that trains stop there only to let off passengers, or, when properly signalled, to let them on. Mary Louise, during the journey, had noted this fact with misgivings that were by no means relieved when she stepped from the sumptuous train, and found before her merely a shed-like structure, open on all sides, that served as station house. Colonel Hathaway and his granddaughter stood silently upon the platform of this shed, their luggage beside them, and watched their trunks tumbled out of the baggage car ahead, and the train start, gather speed, and go rumbling on its way. Then the girl looked around her to discover that the primitive station was really the only barren spot in the landscape, for this was no western prairie country, but one of the oldest settled and most prosperous sections of a great state that had been one of the original thirteen. To be represented by a star on our national banner, Chargrove might not be much of a railway station, as it was only eleven miles from a big city, but the country around it was exceedingly beautiful. Great oaks and maples stood here and there, some in groups and some in stately solitude. The land was well fenced and carefully cultivated. Roads, smooth or ruddy, led in every direction. Flocks and herds were abundant. Half hidden by hills or splendid groves, peeped the roofs of comfortable farmhouses that evidenced the general prosperity of the community. Uncle Eben is late, isn't he, Grandpa Jim? Asked the girl as her eyes wandered over the pretty, peaceful scene. Colonel Hathaway consulted his watch. Our train was exactly on time, he remarked, which is more than can be said for old Eben. But I think, Mary Louise, I now see an automobile coming along the road. If I am right, we have not long to wait. He proved to be right, for presently a small touring car came bumping across the tracks, and halted at the end of the platform on which they stood. It was driven by an old coloured man whose hair was snow white, but who sprang from his seat with the agility of a boy when Mary Louise rushed forward with words of greeting. "My uncle Eb, but it's good to see you again!" she exclaimed, taking both his dusky hands in her own and shaking them cordially. "How is Aunt Polly, and how is your rheumatics?" Rheumatics done gone for good, May Wees," he said, his round face all smiles. "Dis show am one prosperous country for health. Nobody sick but de invalids, and they just imagine stay sick. That's all." "Glad to see you, Uncle," said the Colonel. "A little late, eh? As usual. But perhaps you had a tire change." "No, sir, Colonel. No tire change. I was just trying to hurry along that lazy Joe Brennan, who's done comin' for de trunks." "Joe Brennan is coming then." That's right, Colonel. He's comin'. Done stop before daylight in de lumber wagon, but when I done catch up with dat Joe, a mile and a half away, he won't listen to no reason. So I dodged on ahead to tell you uns that Joe's on de way. How far is it from here to Cracks Crossing then? Inquired Mary Louise. They call it ten miles, replied her grandfather, but I imagine it's nearer twelve. And this is the nearest railway station? Yes, the nearest. But usually the crossing folks who own motor cars drive to the city to take the trains. We alighted here because, in our own case, it was more convenient and pleasant than running into the city and out again, and it will save us time. We be home in half an hour, most likely," added Uncle Eben, as he placed the suitcases and satchels in the car. Colonel Hathaway and Mary Louise followed and took their seats. "Is it safe to leave our trunks here?" asked the girl. "Undoubtedly," replied her grandfather. Joe Brennan will doubtless arrive before long, and really there is no person around to steal them. I've an idea I shall like this part of the country," said Mary Louise musingly as they drove away. "I'm confident you will, my dear. Is Cragg's Crossing as beautiful as this? 
I think it more beautiful. And how did you happen to find it, Grandpa Jim? It seems as isolated as can be. A friend and I were taking a motor trip and lost our way. A farmer told us that if we went to Cragg's Crossing we would find a good road to our destination. We went there, following the man's directions, and encountered beastly roads, but found a perfect gem of a tiny, antiquated town which seems to have been forgotten or overlooked by map-makers, automobile guides, and tourists. My friend had difficulty in getting me away from the town. I was so charmed with it. Before I left I had discovered, by dint of patient inquiry, a furnished house to let, and you know, of course, that I promptly secured the place for the summer. That's the whole story, Mary Louise. It is interesting, she remarked. As a result of your famous discovery, you sent down Uncle Eben and Aunt Polly with our car, and a lot of truck you thought we might need, and now, when all is ready, you and I have come to take possession. Rather neatly arranged, I think, declared the Colonel with satisfaction. Do you know anything about the history of the place, Grandpa, or of the people who live in your tiny forgotten town? Nothing whatever. I imagine there are folks in Cragg's Crossing who have never been a dozen miles away from it since they were born. The village boasts a hotel, the funniest little inn you can imagine, where we had an excellent home-cooked meal, and there is one store and a blacksmith's shop, one church and one schoolhouse. These, with half a dozen ancient and curiously assorted residences, constitute the shy and retiring town of Cragg's Crossing. Ah, I think we have found Joe Brennan. Uncle Eben drew up beside a rickety wagon drawn by two sorry nags, who just now were engaging in cropping grass from the roadside. On the seat half reclined a young man who was industriously eating an apple. He wore a blue-checked shirt open at the throat, overalls, suspenders, and a straw hat that had weathered many seasons of sunshine and rain. His feet were encased in heavy boots, and his bronzed face betokened an out-of-door life. There are a million countrymen in the United States just like Joe Brennan in outward appearance. Joe did not stop munching. He merely stared as the automobile stopped beside him. "'Say you, Joe!' shouted Uncle Eben indignantly. "'What for you done settin' here?' "'Restin,' said Joe Brennan, taking another bite from his apple. "'Ain't you gwine to get them trunks home to-day?' demanded the old darky. Joe seemed to consider this question carefully before he ventured to commit himself. Then he looked at Colonel Hathaway and said, "'What I want to know, boss, is whether I'm hired by the hour or by the day.' "'Didn't Uncle Eben tell you?' "'No, nah, he didn't. He just said to go and get the trunks, and he'd give me a dollar for the trip.' "'Well, that seems to settle the question, doesn't it?' "'Not quite, boss. I be thinking it over, on the way, and a dollar's too pesky cheap for this trip. Sometimes I gets twenty-five cents a hour for hauling things, and this looks to me like a day's work.' "'If you made good time,' said Colonel Hathaway, "'you might do it easily in four hours.' Joe shook his head. "'Not me, sir,' he replied. "'I ain't got the constitution for it. "'And them hosses won't trot less I lick em. "'And if I lick em, I'm guilty of cruelty to animals, "'including myself. "'No, boss, the job's too cheap, "'so I guess I'll give it up and go home.' "'But you're nearly at the station now,' protested the Colonel. "'I know, but it's half a mile further, "'and the hosses is tired. "'I guess I'll go home.' "'Oh, Grandpa,' whispered Mary Louise, "'it'll never do to leave our trunks lying there by the railroad tracks.' The Colonel eyed Joe thoughtfully. "'If you were hired by the day,' said he, "'I suppose you would do a day's work?' "'I'd have to,' admitted Joe. "'That's why I asked you about it. "'Just now it looks to me like I ain't hired at all. "'The black man said he'd give me a dollar for the trunks. "'That's all.' "'How much do you charge a day?' asked the Colonel. "'Dollar and a quarter's my regular price, "'and I won't take no less,' asserted Joe." Mary Louise nearly laughed outright, but the colonel frowned and said, "'Joe Brennan, you've got me at your mercy. I'm going to hire you by the day, at a dollar and a quarter, and as your time now belongs to me, I request you go at once for those trunks. You will find them just beyond the station.' The man's face brightened. He tossed away the core of his apple and jerked the reins to make the horses hold up their heads. "'A bargain's a bargain, boss,' he remarked, cheerfully. "'So I'll get them air trunks to your house if it takes till midnight.' "'Very good,' said the Colonel. "'Drive on, Uncle.' The old servant started the motor. "'That's what I calls downright robbery, Colonel,' he exclaimed, highly incensed. "'Didn't I ask the storekeeper what to pay Joe Brennan for bringing over them trunks? And didn't he say a dollar is big pay for such like a trip? If we's gwine to live in this town, where they don't understand city prices and the high cost of living yet, we got to hold em down and keep em from speculatin' with us, or else we'll spoil em for the time when we's done gone away.' "'Very true, Uncle. 
"'Has Joe a competitor?' Uncle Eben reflected. "'If he has, Cunnel, I ain't seen it,' he presently replied. "'But I guess all he's got is dat lumber wagon.' Mary Louise had enjoyed the controversy immensely, and was relieved by the promise of the trunks by midnight. For the first time in her life, the young orphaned girl was to play housekeeper for her grandfather, and surely one of her duties was to see that the baggage was safely deposited in their new home. This unknown home in an unknown town had an intense fascination for her just now. Her father had been rather reticent in his description of the house he had rented at Cragg's Crossing, merely asserting it was a pretty place, and ought to make them a comfortable home for the summer. Nor had the girl questioned him very closely, for she loved to discover things and be surprised. Whether pleasurably or not did not greatly interfere with the thrill. The motor took them speedily along a winding way to Cragg's Crossing, a toy town that caused Mary Louise to draw a long breath of delight at first sight. The crossing of two country roads had probably resulted, at some far-back period, in farmers building their residences on the four corners, so as to be neighborly. Farmhands or others built little dwellings adjoining, not many of them, though, and some unambitious or misdirected merchant erected a big frame store, and sold groceries, dry goods, and other necessities of life, not only to the community at the crossing, but to neighboring farmers. Then someone started the little hotel, mainly to feed the farmers who came to the store to trade, or the drummers who visited it to sell goods. A church and a schoolhouse naturally followed in course of time, and then, as if its destiny were fulfilled, the sleepy little town, ten miles from the nearest railway, gradually settled into the comatose state in which Colonel Hathaway and his granddaughter now found it. End of chapter 1 Read by Sibella Denton For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Of Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain Chapter Two, The Kenton Place. The tiny town, however, was not all that belonged to the Cragg's Crossing settlement. Barely a quarter of a mile away from the village, a stream with beautifully wooded banks ran diagonally through the countryside. It was called a river by the natives, but it was more of a creek, halfway between a small rivulet and a brook, perhaps. But its banks afforded desirable places for summer residences, several of which had been built by well to do families either retired farmers or city people who wished for a cool and quiet place in which to pass the summer months. These residences, all having ample grounds and facing the creek on either side, were sufficiently scattered to be secluded, and it was to one of the most imposing of these that Uncle Eben guided the automobile. He crossed the creek on a primitive but substantial bridge, turned to the right, and the first driveway led to the house that was to be Mary Louise's temporary home. "'This is lovely!' exclaimed the girl, as they rolled up a winding drive edged by trees and shrubbery, and finally drew up before the entrance of a low and rambling but quite modern house. There was Aunt Polly, her round black face all smiles, standing on the veranda to greet them, and Mary Louise sprang from the car first to hug the old servant, Uncle Eben's spouse, and then to run in to investigate the establishment, which seemed much finer than she had dared to imagine it. The main building was of two stories, but the wings, several of which jutted out in various directions, were one story in height, somewhat on the bungalow plan. There was a good-sized stable in connection, now used as a garage, and down among the oaks toward the river an open pavilion had been built. All the open spaces were filled with flowers and ferns, in beds and borders, and graveled paths led here and there in a very enticing way. But the house was now the chief fascination, and the other details Mary Louise gleaned by sundry glances from open windows as she rambled from room to room. At luncheon, which Aunt Polly served as soon as her young mistress could be coaxed from her tour of inspection, the girl said, "'Grandpa Jim, who owns this place?' "'A Mrs. Jocelyn,' he replied. "'A young woman?' "'I believe so. It was built by her mother, a Mrs. Kenton, some fifteen years ago, and is still called the Kenton Place.' Mrs. Kenton died, and her daughter, who married a city man named Jocelyn, has used it as a summer home until this year. I think Mrs. Jocelyn is a woman of considerable means. "'The furnishings prove that,' said Mary Louise. "'They're not all in the best of taste, but they are plentiful and meant to be luxurious. Why doesn't Mrs. Jocelyn occupy her home this summer? And why, if she is wealthy, does she rent the place?' 
"'Those are problems I am unable to solve, my dear,' replied the colonel, with a smile. "'When old man Cragg, who is the nearest approach to a real estate agent in the village, told me the place was for rent, I inquired the price, and contracted to lease it for the summer. That satisfied me, Mary Louise, but if you wish to inquire into the history and antecedents of the Kenton and Jocelyn families, I have no doubt there are plenty of village gossips who can fill your ears full of it. "'There's one thing I found out, sir,' remarked Uncle Eben, who always served at table and was not too diffident to join in the conversation of his betters at times. "'Dis Jocelyn man done disappear. He run away, or dig out somehow, and he misses his most plumb crazy about it.' "'When did that happen?' asked Mary Louise. "'About Christmas time, does still keep a say. Nobody don't like him down here, cause he put on a extraordinary amount of airs, and didn't mix with the town people no how. The stokekeeper tinks Massa Jocelyn am crooked-like, and done squander a lot at his wife's money before he went. Perhaps, said Mary Louise musingly, that is why the poor woman is glad to rent this house. I wish, however, we had gotten it for a more pleasant reason. Don't pay attention to Eben's chatter, my dear, advised her grandfather. His authority seems to be the ancient storekeeper, whom I saw but once and didn't fancy. He looks like an old owl, in those big horn-rimmed spectacles. "'Dat stokekeeper, he ain't no owl, Colonel,' asserted Uncle Eben earnestly. "'He done know all day is to know round these diggins, and a lot mo too. An owl is a mighty wise bird, Colonel, if I do say it, and no disrespect. So what dat stokekeeper say I's bound to take notice of.' Mary Louise spent the afternoon in examining her new possession and getting settled. For, wonder of wonders, Joe Brennan arrived with the trunks at three o'clock, some nine hours before the limit of midnight.' The colonel, as he paid the man, congratulated him on making such good time. "'Yes,' drawled Joe, "'I done pretty well, considerin'. But if I hadn't hired out by the day, I'd sure been a loser. I've been a good ten hours goin' for them trunks, for I started at five this morning. So if I'd tooken a dollar for the job, I'd only made ten cents an hour, my price being twenty-five. But as it is,' he added with pride, "'I get my regular rate of a dollar and a quarter a day.' proving that it pays to drive a bargain, commented the colonel. Mary Louise unpacked Grandpa Jim's trunk first, and put his room in apple pie order, as Aunt Polly admiringly asserted. Then she settled her own pretty room, held a conference with her servants about the meals and supplies, and found it was then time to dress for dinner. She was not yet old enough to find household duties a bore, so the afternoon had been delightfully spent. Early after breakfast the next morning, however, Mary Louise started out to explore the grounds of her domain. The day was full of sunshine and the air laden with fragrance of flowers, a typical May morning. Grandpa Jim would, of course, read for an hour or two and smoke his pipe. He drew a chair upon the broad veranda for this very purpose, but the girl had the true pioneer spirit of discovery, and wanted to know exactly what her five acres contained. The water was doubtless the prime attraction in such a neighborhood. Mary Louise made straight for the river bank, and found the shallow stream, here scarcely fifty feet in width, rippling over its stony bed, which was a full fifty feet wider than the volume of water then required. When the spring freshets were on, perhaps the stream reached its banks, but in the summer months it was usually subdued, as now. The banks were four feet or more above the rabble of stones below, and close to the bank, facing the river on her side, Mrs. Kenton had built a pretty pavilion, with ample seats and room for half a dozen wicker chairs and a table, where one could sit and overlook the water. Mary Louise fervently blessed the old lady for this idea, and at once seated herself in the pavilion while she examined at leisure the scene spread out before her. Trees hid all the neighboring residences but one. Just across the river, and not far from its bank, stood a small, weather-beaten cottage, that was in sharp contrast with the rather imposing Kenton residence opposite. It was not well kept, nor even picturesque. The grounds were unattractive. A woodpile stood in the front yard, the steps leading to the little porch had rotted away, and had been replaced by a plank, rather unsafe unless one climbed it carefully, Mary Louise thought. There were time-worn shades to the windows, but no curtains. A pane of glass had been broken in the dormer window and replaced by a folded newspaper tacked over it. Beside the porch door stood a wash-tub on edge, a few scraggly-looking chickens wandered through the yard. If not an abode of poverty, it was surely a place where careless indifference to either beauty or the comfort of orderly living prevailed. So much, Mary Louise had observed, 
wondering why Mrs. Kenton had not bought the cottage and torn it down, since it was a blot on the surrounding landscape, when she saw the door open and a man come out. She gave a little gasp of astonishment as her eyes followed this man, who slowly took the path to the bridge, from whence the road led into the village. End of chapter 2 Read by Sibella Denton For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. of Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. The Folks Across the River. Her first glance told the girl that here was a distinctly unusual personage. His very appearance was quaint enough to excite comment from a stranger. It must have been away back in the revolutionary days when men daily wore coats cut in this fashion, straight across the waistline in front, and with two long tails flapping behind. Modern dress coats were much like it, to be sure, but this was of a faded blue-bottle color, and had brass buttons and a frayed velvet collar on it. His trousers were tight-fitting below the knee, and he wore gaiters and a wide-brimmed silk hat that rivaled his own age, and doubtless had seen happier days. Mary Louise couldn't see all these details from her seat in the pavilion across the river, but she was near enough to observe the general effect of the old man's antiquated costume, and it amazed her. Yes, he was old, nearly as ancient as his apparel, the girl decided, but although he moved with slow deliberation his gait was not feeble by any means. With hands clasped behind him and head slightly bowed as if in meditation, he paced the length of the well-worn path, reached the bridge, and disappeared down the road toward the village. That, said a voice beside her, is the poobah of Cragg's Crossing. It is old Cragg himself. Grandpa Jim was leaning against the outer breast of the pavilion, book in hand. "'You startled me,' she said, but no more than that queer old man did. Was the village named after him, Grandpa?' "'I suppose so, or after his father, perhaps, for the place seems even older than old Cragg. He has an office in a bare little room over the store, and I rented this place from him. Whatever his former fortunes may have been, and I imagine the Craggs once owned all the land about here, Old Hezekiah seems reduced to a bare existence. Perhaps, suggested Mary Louise, he inherited those clothes with the land from his father. Isn't it an absurd costume, Grandpa Jim? And in these days of advanced civilization, too. Of course, old Hezekiah Cragg is not strong mentally, or he would refuse to make a laughing-stock of himself in that way. Colonel Hathaway stared across the river for a time without answering. Then he said, I do not think the natives here laugh at him, although I remember they called him Old Swallowtail when I was directed to him as the only resident real estate agent. I found the old man quite shrewd in driving a bargain, and thoroughly posted on all the affairs of the community. However, he is not a gossip, but inclined to be taciturn. There is a fathomless look in his eyes, and he is cold and unresponsive. Country life breeds strange characteristics in some people. The whimsical dress and mannerisms of old Mr. Cragg would not be tolerated in the cities, while here they seem regarded with unconcern, because they have become familiar. I was rather pleased with his personality, because he is the Cragg of Cragg's Crossing. How much of the original plot of land he still owns, I don't know. Why, he lives in that hovel, said the girl. So it seems, although he may have been merely calling there. He fits the place, she declared. It's old and worn and neglected, just as he and his clothes are. I'd be sorry indeed to discover that Mr. Cragg lives anywhere else. The colonel, his finger between the leaves of the book he held, to mark the place where he was reading, nodded somewhat absently and started to turn away. Then he paused to ask, anxiously, "'Does this place please you, my dear?' "'Ever so much, Grandpa Jim,' she replied with enthusiasm, leaning from her seat inside the pavilion to press a kiss upon his bare grey head. "'I've had a sense of separation from all the world, yet it seems good to be hidden away in this forgotten nook.' Perhaps I wouldn't like it for always, you know, but for a summer it is simply delightful. We can rest and rest and rest, and be as cosy as can be. Again the old gentleman nodded, smiling at the girl this time. They were good chums, these two, and what pleased one usually pleased the other. Colonel Hathaway had endured a sad experience recently, and his handsome old face still bore the marks of past mental suffering. His only daughter, Beatrice Burroughs, who was the mother of Mary Louise, had been indirectly responsible for the colonel's troubles, but her death had lifted the burden, 
Her little orphaned girl, to whom no blame could be attached, was very dear to Grandpa Jim's heart. Indeed, she was all he now had to love and care for, and he continually planned to promote her happiness and to educate her to become a noble woman. Fortunately, he had saved considerable money from the remains of an immense estate he had once possessed, and so was able to do anything for his grandchild that he desired. In New York and elsewhere, Colonel James Hathaway had a host of influential friends, but he was shy of meeting them since his late unpleasant experience. Mary Louise, for her part, was devotedly attached to her grandfather, and preferred his society to that of any other person. As the erect form of the old gentleman sauntered away through the trees, she looked after him affectionately, and wagged her little head with hearty approval. "'This is just the place for Grandpa Jim,' she mused. "'There is no one to bother him with questions or sympathy, and he can live as quietly as he likes, and read those stuffy old books. The very name Classics makes me shudder, to his heart's content. He'll grow stronger and happier here, I'm sure.' Then she turned anew to revel in the constantly shifting view of river and woodland that extended panoramically from her seat in the pavilion. As her eyes fell on the old cottage opposite, she was surprised to see a dishpan sail through the open window, to fall with a clatter of broken dishes on the hard ground of the yard. A couple of dish-towels followed, and then a broom and a scrubbing-brush, all tossed out in an angry, energetic way that scattered them in every direction. Then on the porch appeared the form of a small girl, poorly dressed in a shabby gingham gown, who danced up and down for a moment as if mad with rage, and then, observing the wash-tub, gave it a kick which sent it rolling off the porch to join the other utensils on the ground. Next, the small girl looked around her as if seeking more inanimate things upon which to vent her anger, but finding none, she dashed into the cottage, and soon reappeared with a much-worn straw hat, which she jammed on her flaxen head, and then, with a determined air, walked down the plank and marched up the path toward the bridge, the same direction that old Cragg had taken a short time before. Mary Louise gave a gasp of amazement. The scene had been dramatic and exciting while it lasted, and it needed no explanation whatever. The child had plainly rebelled at enforced drudgery, and was going— Where? Mary Louise sprang lightly from her seat, and ran through the grounds to their entrance. When she got to the road she sped along, until she came to the bridge, reaching one end of it just as the girl started to cross from the opposite end. Then she stopped, and in a moment the two met. "'Where are you going?' asked Mary Louise, laying a hand on the child's arm as she attempted to pass her. "'None of your business,' was the curt reply. "'Oh, it is, indeed,' said Mary Louise, panting a little from her run. "'I saw you throw things a minute ago, so I guess you mean to run away.' The girl turned and stared at her. "'I don't know you,' she said. "'Never saw you before. Where'd you come from, anyway?' "'Why, my grandfather and I have taken the Kenton house for the summer, so we're to be your neighbors. Of course, you know, we must get acquainted.' "'You can be neighbors to my granddad, if you like, but not to me. Not by a ginger cookie. I done with this place for good and all, I have, and if you ever see me here again, my name ain't Ingua Scammel. "'Here, let's sit down on the bridge and talk it over,' proposed Mary Louise. "'There's plenty of time for you to run away, if you think you'd better. Is Mr. Cragg your grandfather, then?' "'Yes, old Swallertail it is. Old Humbug is what I calls him. "'Not to his face, do you? I ain't so foolish.' He's got a grip on him like a lobster, and when he's mad at me he grips my arm and twists it till I holler. When Grandad's around, you bet I have to knuckle down, or I gets the worst of it. So he's cruel, is he? Uh-huh. That is, he's cruel when I rouse him, as I got a habit of doing. When things run smooth, Grandad ain't so bad, but I ain't going to stand that slave life no longer, I ain't. I've quit for good. Wherever you go, said Mary Louise gently, you will have to work for someone. "'Someone, perhaps, who treats you worse than your grandfather does. "'No one else is obliged to care for you any way, "'so perhaps you're not making a wise change.' "'I ain't, eh? "'Perhaps not. "'Have you any other relatives to go to?' "'No. "'Or any money? "'Not a red cent. "'Then you'll have to hire out as a servant. "'You're not big enough or strong enough to do much, "'so you'll search a long time before you find work, "'and that means being hungry and without shelter. "'I know more of the world than you do, Ingua.' "'What an odd name you have! "'And I honestly think you are making a mistake "'to run away from your own grandfather.' "'The girl stared into the water "'in sullen silence for a time. "'Mary Louise got a good look at her now, "'and saw that her freckled face might be pretty "'if it were not so thin and drawn. "'The hands lying on her lap were red and calloused with housework, "'and the child's whole appearance indicated neglect, 
from the broken-down shoes to the soiled and tattered dress. She seemed to be reflecting, for after a while she gave a short, bitter laugh at the recollection of her late exhibition of temper, and said, "'It's too late to back down now. I've busted the dishes and smashed things generally.' "'That is bad,' said Mary Louise, "'but it might be worse. Mr. Cragg can buy more dishes.' "'Oh, he can, can he? Where's the money to come from?' "'Is he poor?' "'He ain't got no money, if that's what you mean. That's what he says, anyhow. Says it were a godsend you folks rented that house of him, cause it'll keep us in cornbread and pork for six months if we're careful. Being careful means that he'll eat the pork and I gets a chunk of cornbread now and then.' "'Dear me!' exclaimed Mary Louise in a distressed voice. "'Don't you get enough to eat?' "'Oh, I manages it somehow,' declared Ingua, with indifference. "'I've been swiping one egg a day for weeks and weeks. Grandad says he'll trim me good and plenty if he catches me eatin' eggs, "'cause all that our chickens lay he takes down to the store and sells. "'But he ain't home daytimes to count what eggs is laid, "'and so I watches out and grabs one a day. "'He's mighty cute, I tell you, Grandad is, "'but he ain't cute enough to catch me at the egg swipin'. "'Mary Louise was greatly shocked.' Really, she decided, something must be done for this poor child. Looking at the matter from Ingua's report, the smashing of the dishes might prove serious. So she said, Come, dear, let's go together to your house and see if we can't restore the damage. But the girl shook her head. Nothing can mend them busted dishes, she said, and when Grandad sees him he'll have a fit. That's why I did it. I wanted to show him I'd had revenge afore I quit him cold. He won't be home till night, but I gotta be a long way off before then, so's he can't catch me. Give it up, said Mary Louise. I've come here to live all summer, Ingua, and now that we're friends, I'm going to help you to get along more comfortably. We will have some splendid times together, you and I, and it will be a good deal better off than wandering among strangers who don't care for you. The girl turned and looked into Mary Louise's face long and earnestly. Her eyes wandered to her neatly arranged hair, to the white collar at her throat, then down to her blue serge dress and her dainty shoes. But mostly she looked straight into the eyes of her new friend, and found there sincerity and evident good will. So she sighed deeply, cast a glance at her own bedraggled attire, and said, "'We ain't much alike, us two, but I guess we can be friends. Other girls has come here to the rich people's houses, but they all stuck up their noses at me. You're the first that's ever give me a word.' "'All girls are not alike, you know,' responded Mary Louise cheerfully. So now let's go to your house and see what damage has been done. End of chapter 3. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 4. Getting Acquainted. The two girls had been sitting on the edge of the bridge, but Mary Louise now rose and took Ingua's arm in her own, leading the reluctant child gently toward the path. It wasn't far to the old cottage, and when they reached the yard Ingua laughed again at the scene of disorder. "'It's almost a pity Grandad can't see it,' she chuckled. "'He'd be so crazy he'd have them claws of his'n round my throat in a jiffy.' Mary Louise drew back, startled. "'Did he ever do that?' she asked. "'Only once, but that time near ended me.' It were a long time ago, and he was sorry, I guess, cause he bought me a new dress next day, and new shoes. I ain't had any since, she added disconsolately. So the other day I asked him, wasn't it about time? He choked me again. What did he say to that? Just growled at me. Grandad's got an awful temper when he's good and riled, but usual he's still as a mouse. Don't say a word to me for days together sometimes. Once I saw him— she suddenly checked herself and cast an uneasy, sidelong glance at her companion. Mary Louise was rolling the wash-tub back to the stoop. "'The only thing that will bother us, Ingua,' she said, "'is those dishes. Let us try to count the broken ones. Do you know how many there were?' "'Sure I do,' answered the girl, removing the battered dishpan from the heap of crockery. Two plates, two cups and saucers, a oatmeal dish, a bread plate, and the pork platter. "'Gee, what a smash! One cup's whole, and the oatmeal dish—' The rest is gone up. "'I'm going to dig a hole and bury the broken pieces,' said Mary Louise. "'Have you a spade?' "'There's an old shovel, but it won't do no good to bury of em. Grandad, he counts every piece every day. He counts everything, from the grains of salt to the chickens. Say, once I tried to play a trick on him. I got so hungry for meat I just couldn't stand it, so one day I killed a chicken, thinking he wouldn't miss it. 
"'My, my, what do you suppose? "'Say, you never told me your name yet. "'I am Mary Louise Burroughs. "'High-flying name, ain't it? "'Well, I killed that chicken and cut it up and fried it, "'and et just a leg and a wing "'and hid the rest under my bed in the peak up there, "'where old Swallowtail never goes. "'All the feathers and the head I buried, "'and I cleaned up the hatchet and the frying-pan "'so there wasn't a smitch of anything left "'to prove I'd murdered one of them chicks. "'I was feeling kind of chirky when Grandad came home, "'cause I thought he'd never find out. "'But what did the old villain do but begin to sniff around? "'And he sniffed and he sniffed until he said, "'Ingwa, what chicken did you kill, and where did you kill it? "'You're crazy,' says I. "'What are you talking about?' "'Then he gives me one sour look and marches out to count the chickens. "'And when he comes back, he says, "'It's the brown pullet with the white on the wings. "'It were worth forty cents, and forty cents will buy ten pounds of oatmeal. "'Where's the chicken, girl? "'Ed up,' says I. "'You're lying,' says he. Go get it. Hustle. Well, I saw his claws beginning to work, and it scared me stiff. So I goes to my room and brings down the chicken, and he eyes it quiet like for a long time, and then eats some for his supper. The rest he locks up in the cupboard that he always carries the key to. Say, Mary Louise, I never got another taste of that chicken as long as it lasted. Old Swallowtail ate it all himself and took a week to do it. During this recital the broom and mop and scrubbing brush had been picked up and restored to their proper places. Then the two girls got out the old shovel and buried the broken dishes in a far corner of the yard, among the high weeds. Mary Louise tried to get the dents out of the old dishpan, but succeeded only indifferently. It was so battered through long use, however, that Ingua thought the jams would not be noticed. "'Next,' said Mary Louise, "'we must replace the broken pieces. I suppose they sell dishes at the village store, do they not?' "'That's where these come from, long ago,' replied Ingua. "'But dishes cost money. "'I have a little money in my purse, enough for that, I'm sure. "'Will you go to town with me?' Ingua stared at her as if bewildered. The proposition was wholly beyond her understanding. But she replied to her new friend's question, saying slowly, "'No, I won't go. "'Old Swallowtail'd skin me alive if he caught me in the village. "'Then I'll go alone, and I'll soon be back, "'though I must run over to my own house first to get my purse and my hat.' Let me have one of the cups for a sample, Ingua. She left the child sitting on the plank runway, and looking rather solemn and thoughtful. Mary Louise was somewhat fearful that she might run away in her absence, so she hurried home, and from there walked into the village, a tramp easily accomplished in ten minutes. The store was the biggest building in town, but not very big at that. It was clapboarded and two stories in height, the upper floor being used by Saul Jerrams, the storekeeper, as a residence, except for two little front rooms which he rented, one to Miss Huckins, the dressmaker and milliner, who slept and ate in her shop, and the other to Mr. Cragg. A high platform had been built in front of the store, for the convenience of farmer customers in muddy weather, and there were steps at either end of the platform for the use of pedestrians. When Mary Louise entered the store, which was cluttered with all sorts of goods, not arranged in a very orderly manner, there were several farmers present. But old Saul had his eye on her in an instant, and shuffled forward to wait upon her. "'I want some crockery, please,' she said. He looked at the sample cup and led her to a corner of the room, where a jumble of dishes crowded a single shelf. "'I take it you're one of them new folks at the Kenton place,' he remarked. "'Yes,' said she. "'I thought there was plenty of dishes in that place,' continued Mr. Jerrams in a friendly tone. "'But perhaps you don't want the black folks to eat off in the same things you do yourselves.' Mary Louise ignored this speech and selected the dishes she wanted. She had measured the broken platter and found another of the same size. Old Saul wouldn't sell a saucer without a cup, explaining that the two always went together. The cup to hold the stuff and the saucer to drink it out and— Without argument, however, the girl purchased what she wanted. It was heavy, cheap ware of the commonest kind, but she dared not substitute anything better for it. Then she went to the grocery counter, and after considering what Ingua might safely hide and eat in secret, she bought a tin of cooked corned beef, another of chipped beef, one of deviled ham, and three tins of sardines. Also she bought a basket to carry her purchases in, and although old Saul constantly sought to pump her concerning her past life, present history, and future prospects, she managed to evade successfully his thirst for information. No doubt the fellow was a great gossip, as old Eben had declared, but Mary Louise knew better than to cater to this dangerous talent. The proprietor accompanied her to the door, and she drew back, hesitating, as she observed an old man in a bottle-blue swallowtail coat pace in deliberate, dignified manner along the opposite side of the street. 
"'Who is that?' she asked, as an excuse for not going out, until Ingua's grandfather had passed from sight. "'That? Why, that's old Swallertail, otherwise Hezekiah Cragg, one of our most interesting citizens,' replied Saul, glad of the chance to talk. "'Does he own Cragg's Crossing?' asked Mary Louise. "'Mercy, no. He owned a lot of it once, though, but that were afore my time. Sold it out and squandered the money, I guess, for he lives like a rat in a hole. Maybe, though, he's got some hid away. That's what some of the folks here whispers, folks that's likely to know. But if that's a fact, he's got a streak of miser in him, for he don't spend more than the law allows. He may have lost the money in speculations, suggested the girl. Say, you've hit the nail square on the head, he exclaimed admiringly. Them's my own opinions to a tee. I've told the boys so a hundred times, but they can't get it. Was an old swallertail hand in glove with that slick Mr. Jocelyn, who they say has run away and left his poor wife in the lurch? That's how you got a chance to rent the Kenton house. Jocelyn were slick as butter and high-strung. Wouldn't hobnob with any of us but old swallertail, and that's why I think Cragg was investing money with him. Jocelyn, he came down here three year ago, having married Annabel Kenton in the winter, and the way he swelled around were a caution to snakes. But the poor devil run his rope and lit out. Where he skipped to, I don't know. Nobody seems to know, not even his wife. But they say she didn't have enough money left to count, and by the glum looks of old Swallertail, I'm guessing he got nipped, too. How long ago was that? asked Mary Louise. Sometime about last Christmas, they say. Anyhow, that's when his wife missed him and set up a hunt that didn't do no good. She came down here with red eyes and tramped around in the snow asking questions. But sakes, Ned Jocelyn wouldn't have come out to the old place anyway like this, we didn't never suit his style, you see. So poor Ann Kenton, whose misfortune made her Mrs. Ned Jocelyn, cried and wailed for a day or two, and then crept back to the city like a whipped dog. Funny how women'll care for a worthless, never-do-well chap that happens to be good-looking, ain't it? Mary Louise nodded rather absently. However distorted the story might be, it was curious what had become of Mr. Jocelyn. But her thoughts reverted to another scheme, and she asked, "'Hasn't Mr. Cragg a granddaughter?' "'Oh, you've seen little Ingua Scammel, have you? "'Or maybe just heard tell of her. "'She's the cussedest little coal of fire in seven counties. "'Keeps old Swallowtail guessing all the time, they say, "'just like her mom, Nan Cragg, did afore her. "'Gosh, what a woman her mom were! "'She didn't stay round here much, "'but whenever she ran out of cash "'and didn't have a square meal coming to her, "'she camped on old Swallowtail and made him board her. "'Last time she come she left her youngin, "'that's Ingua, you know, "'and the kid's been here ever since.' "'Sort of a thorn in the side of old Hezekiah, we folks think, "'though he don't never complain. "'She ain't more than twelve or thirteen year old, that Ingua, "'but she keeps house for her granddad, "'what they is to keep, which ain't much. "'I won't let the kid round my store no how, "'cause she swipes everything, from dried apples to peanuts, "'that she can lay her hands on. "'Perhaps she's hungry,' said Mary Louise, "'defending her new friend. "'Like enough, but I ain't feedin' starvin' kids. "'Tain't my business.' "'If old Swallertail don't feed her enough, that's his lookout. "'I've warned him if she sets foot in this store I'll charge him ten cents, just for safety, so he keeps her out. "'He's slick, old Swallertail is, and silent like a secret in all he does and says. "'But he's got to get up earlier in the morning to get the best to old Saul Jerrams, he or his kid, either one.' As Mr. Cragg had now vanished from sight up the street, Mary Louise ventured out, and after a brisk walk deposited her basket on the stoop of the Cragg cottage, where Ingua still sat, swinging her feet pensively, as if she had not stirred since Mary Louise had left her. End of chapter 4. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five of Mary Louise in the Country by L. Frank Baum, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Five, Mary Louise becomes a peacemaker. Here are the dishes, exactly like the broken ones," reported Mary Louise in a jubilant tone as she set down her heavy basket. "Let us go in and wash them, Ingua, and put them away where they belong." The child followed her into the house. All her former pent-up energy seemed to have evaporated. She moved in a dull sort of way that betokened grim resignation. "'I've been planning for months to make a run for it,' she remarked as she washed the new dishes, and Mary Louise wiped them dry. "'And just when I'd mustered up courage to do the trick, along comes you and queered the whole game. "'You'll thank me for that some day, Ingua. Aren't you glad even now that you have a home and shelter?' "'I ain't tickled to death about it. A home! 
with a scornful glance around the room, barren of all comforts. A graveyard's a more cheerful place, to my notion. We must try to make it pleasanter, dear. I'm going to get acquainted with Mr. Cragg, and coax him to brighten things up some, and buy you some new clothes, and take better care of you. Ingua fell back on a stool, fairly choking twixt amazement and derision. You! Coax old Swallertail! Make him spend money on me! Say, if you wasn't a stranger here, Mary Louise, I'd just laugh. But, being as how you're a poor innocent, I'll only say there ain't no power on earth can coax Grandad to do anything better than to scowl and box my ears. You don't know him, but I do. Meantime, said Mary Louise, refusing to argue the point, here are some things for you to hide away, and to eat whenever you please. And she took from the basket the canned goods she had brought, and set them in an enticing row upon the table. Ingua stared at the groceries, and then stared at Mary Louise. Her wan face flushed, and then grew hard. "'You bought them for me?' she asked. "'Yes. So you won't have to steal eggs to satisfy your natural hunger.' "'Well, you can take the truck away again, and you better go with it,' said the girl indignantly. "'We may be poor, but we ain't no beggars, and we don't take charity from nobody.' "'But your grandfather will pay our own bills and buy our own fodder. The Crags is just as good as your folks, and I'm a crag to the backbone,' she said, her eyes glinting angrily. "'If we want to starve, it's none of your business, nor nobody else's.' And springing up, she seized the tins one by one, and sent them flying through the window, as she had sent the dishpan and dishes earlier in the morning. "'Now, then, follow your charity, and make yourself scarce.' And she stamped her foot defiantly at Mary Louise, who was dumb with astonishment. It was hard to understand this queer girl. She had made no objection to replacing the broken dishes, yet a present of food aroused her to violent anger. Her temper was positively something terrible in so small a person, and remembering her story of how old Swallowtail had clenched his talon-like fingers and twisted Ingua's arm till she screamed with pain, Mary Louise could well believe the statement that the child was a crag to the backbone. But Mary Louise, although only a few years older than Ingua, had had a good deal more experience, and was, moreover, a born diplomat. Astonished, though she was, she quickly comprehended the peculiar pride exhibited in a refusal to accept food from a stranger, and knew she must sue the girl's outraged spirit of independence if they were to remain friends. "'I guess I'll have to beg your pardon, Ingua,' she said quietly. "'I was grieved that you are so often hungry, while I have so much more than I need, and the money which I spent was all my own to do what I liked with. If I were in your place and you in mine, and we were good chums, as I know we're going to be—' I'd be glad to have you help me in any little way you could. True friends, Ingua, share and share alike, and don't let any foolish pride come between them. She spoke earnestly, with a ring of sincerity in her voice that impressed the other girl. Ingua's anger had melted as quickly as it had roused, and with sudden impulsiveness she seized Mary Louise's hands in her own, and began to cry. "'I'm as wicked as they make em, she wailed. "'I know I am, but I can't help it, Mary Louise. It's borned in me.' I want to be friends with you, but I won't take your charity if I starve. Not now, anyhow. Here, I'll go get the stuff and put it back in your basket, and then you can lug it home and do what you please with it. They picked up the cans together, Ingua growing more calm and cheerful every moment. She laughed at Mary Louise's disappointed expression and said, I don't always have tantrums. This is my bad day, but the devils will work out of me by tomorrow, and I'll be as sweet as sugar. I'm sorry, but it's the crag blood that sets me crazy at times. Won't you run over and see me? asked Mary Louise, preparing to go home. When? This afternoon. Ingua shook her head. I dasn't, she said. I gotta hold myself in the rest of the day so's I won't fight with old Swallertail when he comes home. Anyhow, I ain't fit to show up around your swell place. That black coon of yours would turn me out if he saw me coming, thinking I was a tramp. Mary Louise had a bright idea. "'I'm going to have tea tomorrow afternoon in that summer-house across the creek,' she said. "'I will be all alone, and if you will come over and join me, we'll have a nice visit together. "'Will you, Ingua?' "'I guess so,' was the careless answer. "'When you're ready, just wave your handkerchief, and if the devils ain't squeezing my gizzard like they is to-day, I'll be there in a jiffy.'" End of chapter 5 Read by Sibella Denton For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org